So um, as I was mentioning, um, kind of, I'll kind of briefly go through a little bit. I think a lot of things have already been touched on. A wonderful stage has been set for so many of the concepts and, and things I'm going to talk about in here. Uh, but just focusing a little bit on um, a project that we conducted based on some of the wintertime aspects of TechNote 14 uh, produced by NRCS and some of those um, pieces and parts and a little bit of the science. And, to just kind of set the stage just a tad, um, the four hours of nutrient management, we've touched on many of these concepts already today. And I think what we did here for sure, um, that the rate part of thing, and R by the way, just stands for right. Um, and then you have all these four other things. So um, we've got the right rate, which I, we just saw in the previous presentation that absolutely rate matters. If you put too much of nitrogen out there, like if you eat too many calories, they're gonna go in excess somewhere. So um, the nitrogen rate really does make a difference. If you nail that with good agronomics, then you're going to limit the rest of your problems from there on out. Uh, the source also matters, whether that be from different types of manure or different types throughout the year or different manure or uh, fertilizer sources period um, as well. And the right placement, of course, you want to put this in the right places. You don't want to put it too close to water bodies or over susceptible areas, etc. But more importantly, what I'm going to talk about is the right time. And so what we created was something called application risk management, uh, or ARM, which I'll refer to it as, and it focuses on the timing of application, and we'll show how that makes a difference uh, throughout the year. Um, so the grant that I'm referring to is an EPA watershed grant that we're very grateful that we got, and then we've had some other supplement little piece come into that. Uh, USGS has been a partner with us on some of our groundwater monitoring as well, which has been a really nice partnership. And our collaborative data has produced some interesting uh, results and dynamics that we've been able to see. And so basically, application risk management is a, is a method of assessing and mitigating runoff and leaching associated with manure application on a temporal, that timing, as well as the spatial or location scale uh, for year round. I'm obviously going to focus on the winter time. Uh, what ARM is not, and I always have to say this, this is not a storage alternative. This is not a way for you to dump uh, manure, which is waste management, not manure management, um, at inappropriate times. And it's not a method to determine agronomic rate. So it's really just about determining risk associated with when you're putting out manure and where you're going to put it. When should this be used all year round? Obviously, you should always have good practices, but today I'm going to mostly focus on winter since that's a bit about what this symposium is focused on. So mostly nitrogen aspects and mostly wintertime application and what that looks like. But what we do throughout the year absolutely affects what happens during that other time period. So I'm going to link back a little bit to some of these things. Um, essentially, also what's important is when we talk about winter and we talk about application in western Washington, which is another, um, is kind of the focus area, we're talking about application to forages uh, for the most part. If you're applying to fallow fields, you may want to go take a step back and look at that whole agronomics piece. So we're definitely talking about forage application in that period as well. Uh, and where this project kind of spawned from essentially was the TechNote 14, the winter spreading application that was put out. Um, 2002 uh, by NRCS and in there and in the 590 there's essentially language that says that application of manure particularly during the winter period must meet appropriate criteria and those include a risk assessment process and to evaluate that risk of applied nu uh, nutrients associated with movement to surface and groundwater and there's language in there and specifically in the Tech Note 14 which was revised this February that defines Pieces such as you need a risk assessment process, some type of site characteristic evaluation, uh, what are the soil conditions and what are limitations. So we took all that data and we kind of, or all those concepts and ideas, and we said, all right, let's create a system that farmers can use real time to evaluate these conditions and make better decisions so that we are limiting that groundwater and surface water contamination pathway. And so what we did is there's essentially, if a producer wants to apply, they need to go now through a handful of processes. And of course, determining agronomic rate, is it appropriate to go out there in the first place? And if so, how much? And then once that's determined, then it's, we've created a couple tools, which I'm gonna show you, manure spreading advisory, along with seasonal manure application setback distances, uh, looking at field evaluation risk maps, so knowing your fields on your farm specifically and where your hot spots are, what times of year you should be going where. 
Um, so that's a process. Filling out a worksheet, that's kind of the heart of this, that does that evaluation and risk assessment. And then applying and monitoring your fields. And so um, I'm, uh, this is a year-round assessment, obviously. I'm going to focus on the winter, and I'm going to focus on these three things only. The agronomic rate and applying and monitoring um, have been already talked about in separate arenas and um, are, are pretty obvious pieces. So this uh, spreading advisory, as you can see here, um, it's, it's for all of Western Washington, and actually Western Oregon also has this now. And it's a real-time advisory that you can go on a daily basis, and it gives color coding for you know, red is high risk, all the way down to green means go kind of a thing. And it's a way a farmer can go here during, you know, every day and see, okay, what's the risk today? And when they click on their area, they actually get a three-day forecast. So maybe, as you can see, today is low, tomorrow is low. Those are good days to get out, but in three days, it's going to be high. So you want to schedule to get things done today. And it can flip such that you may see, like, it's really high today, but in a couple of days, it's low. And so a producer can use this to evaluate. So we've taken some... Uh, more complex things like the forecast and some variables and been able to put that into a tool that they can use to make real-time decisions. And this is specifically for runoff. We're going to be adding in a leaching and soils risk later, um, layer later um, in the year, in the next year maybe. Um, so we're working on putting that in right now. And essentially, um, when they look at those things on this page as well, they have our current manure setback distance. And so instead of just having one distance all year round, We've got a variable distance throughout the year that really correlates to when we can see a potential for a runoff event or some of our bigger issues. And as well as even during the shoulder seasons, we can kind of keep that. Like this year, we had rain really far, big events later than we normally would the other years. So we kept that distance far before it started coming down and vice versa. So we've got a way to communicate with them as well as giving real-time text. Um, to those guys that say don't apply but in two days this or whatever so they get a lot of information there um, we're able to even track this so using Google Analytics we can see when people visit our web page and how often they do that the coolest part is when you overlay the precipitation events onto that you can see when they look at it and uh, that they look at it at good times. so when we have really big rain events no one's looking at it ahead of time which is great because no one should be thinking about applying but when we start getting into a period of nice weather uh, with fewer precipitation events or ones that are a little bit unknown, you see there's a lot of activity of folks looking at that. So um, people actually use it, which is wonderful. Uh, and then the field risk assessment. So this is kind of a Whatcom County larger perspective here, and I'll bring it down. But the red dots represent dairy operations, and the green, which is a little hard to see, represents fields in our county, and then the background colors represent the risk associated with soils. And this is a very um, kind of 30,000 foot level, if you will, on those. And this is for runoff. And you can see that the red dots here represent our lower risk fields. So there aren't a ton. If you separate out the risk associated with fields, you can see that we've the low risk fields that we have are um, you know, just over 20% or so. And I highlight that because it's those low risk fields that are the only ones applicable for any time of winter application, whatever that means, right? And we'll define that here in a second, but it's not like it's 100% of fields, it's a very select few that actually qualify for that. And every county is kind of similar on the west side. You're gonna have a variation on, on those different soil types. And more and more of these in our county are moving over to different types of agriculture. Um, with less uh, overview on them. When you move that down to an individual risk, uh, field risk, here's an example of that. So you can have a farm, this is their runoff risk rating, and you can see that the different colors, red being high risk fields, blue being low risk, they can have a lot of different variability in their fields right in a small area. And this has to do with slope or swales or soil type is the main variable. And when we do the same evaluation for their leaching risk rating, you can see it's pretty much just inverse. So they're going to use one map during our high runoff risk times of the year, and they're going to use another map during the high leaching risk times of the, of the year to understand which fields they should be going out to what time of year and what their risk is going to be associated with that. So this is a nice way for farmers They usually know this stuff, but it's a nice way for them to remember that or to go out to those specific fields. So this is a step towards developing a custom manure application strategy. And then the most important step of all that, once you look at the forecast, you've done your agronomics, you look at the forecast, 
you know which fields you should go out to, and now there's a worksheet that you need to fill out so you can determine the risk for applying on that day to that specific field. And essentially what this does is, you, though this is just part of the worksheet, uh, but they look at the forecast, they look at uh, soil conditions such as soil moisture, uh, water table level, they're going to look at things such as their forage quality and density and height, uh, what type of manure application uh, equipment are they using, what type of um, protective measures they have in place, etc. And they put all that into this worksheet and along the way it gives them feedback and risk and at the very bottom it gives them a risk rating for that. So it may be high in which case they need to evaluate a different field, it could be low in which case they um, we'll go out to that field and apply. Everything looks pretty good. In the end, of course, it's always their um, accountability and uh, record keeping tool that they can utilize these uh, for. Uh, there's also a web page that has a lot of guidance to support this and help people make better decisions and management on that. And uh, what we have, what the kind of background of all this is, is we are doing a lot of field measurements to proof these things up. So all of those risk ratings that come through in that worksheet have to be validated in some way. And so we have a field uh, campaign going on collecting data to show that so that we have a better understanding of the nutrient cycle on certain soil types. Uh, we can determine what is a high risk and low risk field as appropriate and tune those values in the worksheet. And this is helping us optimize uh, manure application strategies and timing and all those variables, as well as all the tools that you've seen. And so just to kind of go through um, kind of briefly in the little bit of time I have allotted here, I'm just going to kind of graze over a lot of our data, uh, but essentially just highlight some of the big points. And number one is, this is obvious, and we had another grant um, to help us supplement this data, is that you know, manure and nitrogen um, conversion and availability varies throughout the year, right? If we have a lot of rain, your lagoon uh, per volume is going to be far more dilute in January than it's going to be in, let's say, September when we haven't had rain for quite a while. That's obvious. As well as the conversion of manure itself does not have nitrate in it. It's very, very little. It's organic nitrogen and ammonium nitrogen. And you have to apply that to the soil, and the soil microbes have to convert that to nitrate, which is that plant usable form. We saw that nitrogen cycle earlier. And how that happens, when that happens, is very much dependent on the soil temperature. And our data has absolutely reflected that. So we can use that when looking at wintertime application, when you apply, and what is going to be that conversion rate. It's going to be really slow January, February, while our soils are cold and warming up. And it's going to go the opposite at the end of the year. When our soils are still warm, you're still going to have a big conversion rate in September, October, and then it's going to kind of taper off. So that's really important to understand. Uh, what we've seen to those fields that have practiced this winter application, in January we always have this big chunk of really nice weather that we have a low risk for any type of runoff event. And so we've got a handful of test fields that are applying during that period on half the field, and the other half they're not. They're waiting till February or March to apply, which is the conventional uh, practice. And on those fields that get out earlier, we've seen about a 25% greater increase in forage density, which is wonderful. Uh, that increase in density means there's less potential for water to quickly move off that field. It's going to slow it down, allow more infiltration, capture more sediment, reduce pathogen, pathogen loads to a surface body um, if nearby. We're also seeing a larger increase in, in early season yields, between 10 and 40 percent, depending on the soil type. So that's also pretty significant. And of course, soil type has a huge influence. I don't have to beat that horse. I think we've heard that over. Sandy soils are going to have greater leaching than clay-based soils. Clay-based soils are going to have a greater chance of runoff than well-drained sandy type soils. That one's pretty obvious, but we're able to verify that. And that's where the timing comes in the biggest. It's the soil type. If you look at any one factor, soil type is the one that dictates the most when you should or shouldn't be out there. Uh, nitrate leaching is the biggest problem during the fall and winter. What you do at the end of the season in September, um, maybe even August, September, October, that's what dictates your fall leaching event. What you do in January does not. That does not have an effect on that kind of wintertime leaching, and I'll show you a graph that shows that. So focus on fall for leaching. Runoff is obviously a factor uh, when we have a lot of rain, and your soil type is either saturated, it's, you don't have a very permeable soil, etc. 
So we have the biggest problem right now. This is our time of year when we need to really focus on runoff, when our soils are saturated from the winter, and then we get these big rain events, and that's what you need to focus on for the most part. So definitely winter, spring for runoff. And then we already heard um, irrigation can actually, improper irrigation, over-irrigation on the wrong soils can push nitrogen right through the usable kind of root zone, right past that, and then it's available in the fall for for push down even further into our water table with rain. So very important to focus on your proper irrigation through the summer months. So just a couple quick graphs. I just have to show this one so everyone has the right context in their brain when we're talking about forage is the, the grass growth. So it does grow somewhat during the winter time. It has the largest growth here in March, April, May, a decreasing growth through the summer. If you're irrigating, this can be supplemented, and then it continues to decline. And why I highlight this is that manure, when you put it out, is not available like that, like chemical fertilizers. It can take one, two, three months before conversion happens. When you apply manure in this early season, it's not gonna be available until about right here, March, April, May, and it actually lines up really well with the warming conversion in the grass growth. That's why we're seeing those higher forage yields. If you, don't, if you can't apply manure until February or March um, due to rain events or your soil type conversion, by the time you get it out, it's not really converting and available until you're at peak or over, and you really miss that early season. You can catch up later on, potentially, but then maybe your rates are off, and now you have all this excess nitrogen at the end of the year that's going to be available for loss. So really focusing on that is important. Um, this is a very wild graph, I realize, and it puts everything together in some respects. Um, and you've got your precipitation, you've got forage, soil temperature, grass growth, uh, groundwater nitrate and soil nitrate. And without spending too much time explaining this, the point is all these things are really linked. You cannot really ignore one without the other because they're all affecting each other really significantly. And uh, this is kind of our, our data represented in a smooth graphical form for presentation purposes. But what you can see here in particular is that as um, the grass growth increases, which is the orange line here, you can look at that. It's really tied to this temperature, soil temperature, which is the purple line here, as well as soil nitrate. So soil nitrate availability and the temperature usually are really kind of right with each other for manure application. This is not too surprising. But what you do see here, the yellow line would be our precipitation. And you can see that this one is correlated with groundwater nitrate. So somewhat, so obviously as you lose um, the uh, soil nitrate levels, it's moved into ground uh, water as our precipitation has increased. And so this is in a system with maybe some over application of nitrogen and some available for loss. So you've kind of got this um, kind of really dynamic system. Uh, we also see this in, uh, this is a graph of soil nitrate by depth. So you can see here, and I'll just highlight a couple things. Um, is that here's kind of our winter periods. Uh, this is uh, kind of, let's see, we're looking at about end of January, or excuse me, this is the high uptake period, end of January, March, April, um, same here, and this is kind of our late fall, uh, just to highlight a couple things. But essentially in the um, early application, which this would be that early application, we don't see it really turn up uh, here in the early season, so we're not seeing that conversion until right here where it's needed. And that's where we see that it's far more available. And then come the fall, when uh, in that early, if you apply early, you have to stop application in about August. And then our other side is um, starting in February and applying late. And that field that you applied to late all the way through the end of October, we really see that pop up here in the winter time. So that's when we see all of these right here, for instance, um, or all of the depth down to three feet where you can see it just pushing through as that rain comes because it was just out too long in the season. It was available. You got the same amount out there as Jeb Tide talked about earlier, 400 pounds once or split it up. But the timing of that split makes all the difference in the world. You put it out too late on sandy soils and you're going to have a huge loss rate. And we're seeing that in our soil. We're also able to see that in the groundwater. And so here's just a, a, the final graph that shows a, bit of, a few of these things all together. So we're looking at groundwater, soil, as well as lysimeters or soil water. So as the 
water kind of flows through the soil, it's collected into these buckets that are buried down. And we're able to look at that at one, two, and three feet. And essentially what you're looking here is that the arm, uh, so the circles represent the groundwater. And this is very similar to what Barb um, also kind of presented on, is the red is conventional. So that's applying, you know, from February to October. And the arm system is this yellow applying from January and stopping at the end of August. And we see that during the winter, which is right here, so um, here's your late fall application, and you start seeing this split big time. So there's a lot left over, and you can see that in our soil samples, that as you go through, it's really showing up here all the way through that winter period. And then it doesn't catch up or kind of equalize until about um, April, May period, and then you kind of see them and they match through the summertime when things, and then they start splitting again. So we've seen this every, all the years we have kind of replicate out. So it really does matter, and what you do see in the soil is that there is far more nitrate available during the growing season in the fields that were applied to earlier than the ones that are applied to late, which is great. That's what we want to see. We want it available for that grass so it can get going. And the blue lines in the background represent precipitation. And you can see that obviously when we get start getting this huge precipitation in that fall period, so this is October, November, December, that's when you really see those things starting to show up. You see the loss come down from the soil and increase into the wells. And so I'm, I know I'm kind of going over this data quite quickly and we have so much data, um, but due to time, um, I can kind of talk about some of those principles later. Or now I think we have a few minutes for questions. Um, maybe I can answer some questions if there's any, any questions on any of those principles. About, sorry, what effect? About. Well, we talked about how important um, the summer season is for leaching to groundwater and of nitrates. And then the winter time right now, from runoff to surface water. And what about the interactive effect of the surface water groundwater, particularly when you have a very shallow, well, your water is so close to the surface up there? Does that have a role? Yeah, you bet. So that has a really big role. So the, the fields that are going to have a water table come up are typically probably your more silty clay-based soils. And so those are the ones that you've probably, you can't get to until quite late. And I think what you're getting to as well as if you have over application and you've got conversion and there's excess that hasn't been taken up by the plant, as that water table comes up, it can collect that and as that water table recedes it can take it back down with you which is why it's so important to match your rate with your timing on those fields where you know your water table is going to come up to near the surface and we do have a test field i didn't present that data here but we do have a test field that has a soil type and a dynamic system like that we've only been looking at it for about a year so we don't have enough data to show much but what we are seeing preliminary is that those fields actually you want to get out to um, a little bit later and get kind of a coldness you're going to capture that uh, nitrogen as organic nitrogen and as ammonium you're not going to get that conversion to nitrate quite yet but because that water table comes up and we saw this in another study you're going to have some denitrification that happens there so that saturation of the water um, into that soil you're going to have the losses go that way so we're still actually exploring that dynamic that you're asking about. Um, if anything, that groundwater surface water interface does happen, and it happens either by a saturation effect where you're going to increase runoff or by a growing and, and taking back down of whatever happened on the surface. So hopefully that answers that somewhat. OK. Are there questions for Nicole? You're loud, way off, hear you. <laughs> so, Nicole, I wonder if you could comment a little bit about uh, any possibility you see, this is all the leaching realm down not from the outside, but you see the possibility of nitrification uh, inhibitors or any kind of other management tool so that we can stop the leaching of nitrate? It's, 
kind of somewhat true, but I'm not sure if we were necessarily yet, but have you looked at that yet? You know, we have not looked at that in this study. So I'm aware of some of those, and we can think of it conceptually based on the data we've collected or some of the principles we've talked about. And if you think about something like a nitrogen inhibitor, what that does is just prolongs the ability for conversion of those nitrogen forms and manure into a nitrate form. And so there are times a year, let's say um, you have a good window for application, but you don't want your manure quite to get converting or you're using a different type of fertilizer. That's when the addition of something like that would be great to kind of get it out there when it's safe and you have a, a not a runoff issue, but prolong it so that you kind of skip a leaching window, let's say. So there are, you know, conceptually we could say yes. I think some of those different products could have um, a really positive effect for managing the dance between the runoff and leaching that we do see. Mm -hmm. Okay, any final questions for Nicole? I think right here in the front. Oh, sorry. Oh, so just to follow up on your comment there on the nitrification inhibitors, uh, the ones that we use on sweet corn, uh, they last for about a month in um, May. So they might last longer than a month in, with the, the uh, cooler temperatures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like October, November, December to kind of get through those months uh, to prevent leaching issues. It might be a nice end of the season for fields that you can't get out to really late the next year. If you can hold it until the soil is look cold enough um, to let it overwinter and then you get conversion later. So it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Okay, any last one? Thank you very much, Nicole.